Hello, it's Jason Heath of Contrabass Conversations coming to you with another special episode today with Jennifer Rosenfeld. We are talking entrepreneurship, marketing, your business brain, and so many other topics. And you know, obviously, I'm a bass player. <laughs> this podcast is called Contrabass Conversations, and I'm very deep inside that whole world, teaching, performing, going to concerts, events, interviewing people, that sort of thing. But the truth is, I've entered this whole other world of online business and especially podcasting. And through this world, I've developed all these fascinating relationships with people across various disciplines from Scott Devine of Scott's Bass Lessons to Andrew Hitz of The Entrepreneurial Musician. And Jennifer is also deep in this world with her company, I Cadenza. And she's been helping musicians level up their career since 2009. Now, we go real deep inside baseball on the whole podcasting thing, which I totally love. And I'll bet that there are a few people listening to this episode that have actually listened to every show we reference. I'm going to link up, though, to all the shows we talk about. So if you want to dig deeper into the topics that Jennifer and I talk about, definitely check out the show notes. And we're talking about Coro, her new offering from iCadenza, the history behind iCadenza, what you can do to better market yourself, and much more. And by the way, the Seth that Jennifer and I are talking about is Seth Haynes, the author of Break Into the Scene and a past podcast guest of mine. All right, here we go with our conversation with Jennifer Rosenfeld. We got plenty of things to chat about. Yeah. Like I've seen your name pop up many times. Like, how did that, how did you get connected with Seth? So I've just gotten to know Seth through the, through our world of, you know, music, entrepreneurship, people. And um, yeah, so he's been helping me out as part of this new initiative that we've launched. So yeah, but I really like Seth and been impressed with what he's doing. And it's so cool to see all of these classical music podcasts, you know, and yours, you've been doing this for so long. It's just amazing. Yeah, it's it's really cool to see how much has popped up in like the last, two, let's say two years, maybe mm-hmm. two years ish. Because if I go back to like 2013 or 2014, I mean, there's not much. Yeah. Right? And and I, I've speculated on like why now? I don't have a really good answer, but I, I even did an article for uh, Adaptistration. I don't know if you're familiar mm-hmm. with that. You know, yeah. Drew McManus and because so, Seth did his book launch and his strategy was get on all of these podcasts, right? And so he did the rounds. I mean, I had him on, he was on like Claire and Eat, he was on Andrew hits his podcast and, and it seemed like his book sold pretty well. So that was the first time I'd seen anybody actually kind of use this community to, to leverage something. So mm-hmm. do you have any thoughts on why so much activity in podcasting in the classical music, arts music world? You know, it's, it's really interesting. I remember around when we started our company, we started in 20, 2009. And um, I think around then, that's sort of when I remember sort of seeing this first like bump in general interest in podcasts. And then it seemed like it sort of died down. And then I don't know, like a year or two ago, Somehow it seemed like podcast popularity just skyrocketed. And, you know, I'm, I'm a very late adopter to everything, just personally. But, um, you know, I found all of my friends were saying, yeah, I listen to all these podcasts. And it just became this thing. So I don't know why, but it seems like there is something happening within the last year or so where it was a thing that people are doing. It's, it's almost like living in Chicago. It, it got to the point where there was a new microbrewery like every week. Like, and it's almost like that, like, like there's yeah. this guy, Yuri Cataldo, uh, who did, he advanced your art. I'm not sure if you're familiar. Yeah. Um, mm-hmm. So we got connected and I chatted with him. Uh, there's another podcast called Off the Podium that I just, oh. it's like, I, like, I can't resist volunteering myself to be on everybody's podcast. So I've been on like most of these arts podcasts just, mm-hmm. I, I don't know why, but it's like late at night and I think like I should be on that show. So That's I, awesome. So, well, you have to be on our podcast well, then. I would, I would love to be on you. your podcast. Yeah. I've, I've, I've really enjoyed following along uh, with, and it's cool that you're, how did you connect it to Andrew Hitz, the Nepello so, Media thing? Yeah, you know, it's funny. Um, so we, we were on their podcast when we released our book, which was in the fall of 2015. And um, it was funny because a few months after that, I met Lance at a conference and we were just talking and I was saying, you know, I'm thinking about starting a podcast, but I don't know, like, I really don't know anything about the technology. And he was like, Oh, yeah, you should do it. You should absolutely do it. You can we'll post them on pedal note media, we'll 
give you all the advice. So um, Andrew helped me figure out what equipment to buy. And so they really sort of gave us the push to start our podcast, which was really funny. What do you what do you do at Stanford? So I don't do anything there at the moment, okay. but I got um, my graduate degree there in law and business. And while I was there, I taught a course on, I forget what we called it, but it was basically career preparation for music and um, the art students. So I did that for two years and I helped sort of create the framework for it. That course is still existing, but someone else teaches it. And I, I do like guest speaking there on occasion. I know a lot of the faculty. What did you do your undergrad in? I did history and Russian literature. Really? Yeah. So I did a lot of music outside of that. Uh, I'm a pianist and um, done a lot of choral singing. And um, I actually just wrote a blog post that came out last week about sort of my experiences with like defining myself as a musician and, you know, different situations with teachers that made that more challenging. But now I'm getting really into composition. I'm starting to write my own music and taking lessons. So really? that's been a lot of fun. Mm-hmm. Wow. Oh, that's cool. Why composition? Like, what spark? Were you always interested, or did something spark that interest? You know, since I was in in high school, my dream has always been to write musicals. Really? So yeah, and I never really did anything with it. And then I was like, life is too short. Why wait? It's not going to happen unless I do something about it. <laughs> What's your first musical going to be about? So. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, so the one I'm working on now, it's kind of a dark topic. It's um, There was this resistance movement in Nazi Germany called the White Rose. It was a group of students who, um, it was interesting, they all had this deep connection to music and the arts, and they wrote these pamphlets protesting Hitler, and then they were all executed. But so that subject matter is really inspiring to me. So that's that's what I'm working on right now. But we'll see how it goes. A longtime friend of mine, I've actually had him on my podcast like way back in the day, a composer named Bjorn Burkhout. Mm-hmm. Yeah, teaches out in New York City, and he's he's gotten really into writing musicals. But his mm-hmm. first musical is like the polar opposite. It was all about Fire Island, <laughs> and <laughs> like just very very happy. Uh, That's awesome. Uh, yeah. so a lot a lot of major keys. I need to read that blog post. I haven't, I haven't seen that. Oh, just about sure defining, defining yourself as a musician. How much does that play into like your identity right now? Like if people say like, hi, Jennifer, what do you do? Like, what, what do you, like, I don't know what to say. I mean, I just usually say I'm a bass player, even, you know, because it's just a simple answer these days. Like what, how do you define yourself? Which is a wow. broad, broad question. <laughs> Sorry. It's, a, it's a big question. And it's, it's something that I've thought a lot about, especially in writing this article. I mean, sort of the short story is that, you know, like growing up, music was, I thought I was going to be a musician. I couldn't imagine doing anything else. And then when I was a freshman in college, I had, you know, in a situation with a teacher who said, like, you have terrible technique. I don't know how you can play the piano at all. And I, like, interpreted that to be, to mean that, the person I thought I was, was a lie, that I wasn't a musician, that I couldn't call myself that. I still did a lot of music, you know, started I Cadenza, but I felt like I couldn't call myself a musician and was sort of afraid people would find out that I wasn't a real musician because I wasn't a music major or because I, like, this teacher told me this one thing. So um, it's really taken a long time for me to recognize the fact that I want to call myself a musician. I want to be actively engaged in making music. I don't make a living that way. You know, I, that's, it's not my job. So I don't know that I'd call myself a professional musician, but it's something that I want to expand in terms of how much time I give to it. And I would love for it to be a part of my personal career business model um, at some point. So I'm sort of at the beginning of my own musical journey in many ways. And it's cool because I'm feeling in in many ways like more in the same boat with a lot of the people that we work with than I ever have before in terms of the kinds of questions you have to grapple with when it comes to like being a musician and putting yourself out there because that's something I've never done. And that's like that's like the challenge that so many people like like I'm I being a, being a musician and putting yourself out there, right? And it's like something that music schools are, with some exceptions, notoriously bad at that, right? The 1950s model, if you look at like either curriculum, and this is something Andrew Hitz loves to talk about, and I love 
as well, but like curriculum or like what we're performing or this or that. If you look at 1950 and you look at 2017, um, they're not too different, right? And if you look at anything else that people are doing in pretty much any career, right, how radically it's changed. Um, but maybe before we even dig into that, like wh- what inspired you to start iCadenza? How did that all happen? What's the story behind that? So I co-founded it with Julia Torgovitskaya Rappaport. She's my best friend from high school. We met when we were like 13 through choir. We we always just did music together and we had this dream that one day we'd start a, a business together, sort of as a joke. We never thought we would actually do it. And then we were seniors in college and Julia was at Tufts. I was at Stanford And we were both trying to figure out what we were going to do after we graduated. And Julia got an email about a business plan competition at Tufts where she was at school. And we just said, why not? Why don't we just enter it? We don't know anything about business, but maybe we can do something together in the arts. So we spent all of winter break writing a business plan. We had no idea what we were doing, but somehow we managed to win second place in the business plan competition We want a tiny bit of money and some other resources and support. And we said, all right, let's do this. So that initial idea ended up not working. Um, But we, we started to pivot, you know, soon after. We were committed to at least doing this for a year before we moved on with our lives and got real jobs or went to grad school. And we became really interested in sort of the career journey of musicians. The first thing we did was video interviews with both emerging and established artists. And then um, we started really learning about how so many musicians have really fantastic artistic talents that's really trained in school, but they're not taught how to turn that into a career that's meaningful and fulfilling and also financially viable. So we started coaching in that area, sort of became our obsession of how do we help people get the skills they need to successfully transition into careers that they're happy with. So that's sort of how it started. Wow. What what was the first business plan, might I ask? Yeah. (laughs) Um, So we wanted to help arts organizations reach younger audiences using social media. And this was in 2009. Arts organizations did not use social media at that time. And we, we, we got a few meetings with some bigger organizations, and they basically said, you know, who are you two girls? Like, you don't know anything. We're fine. So we felt like, you know, this is not going to be, this is not going to work. People are not listening to us. We, we really don't know anything. <laughs> so we need to figure something else out. How are you thinking you're going to help them? I, I'm just curious because like, like I, I do work for different nonprofits. I, I'm on the board of directors for International Society of Basis. And we're, we're having that conversation all the time. Like what, what were you, what were you imagining you were going to do with them? Yeah, well, so at the time, you know, we were just really thinking about, what would it take to get younger people there from our perspective? And a lot of it, I think, is around a sense of community and feeling like you go to an event and you look around and you say, oh, these are my people. I want to be I want to be here. So a lot of it was around how do you create events um, that engage younger audiences and help them connect with other people who they know are going sort of we had an idea for a Facebook app, which I mean, those are not even a thing anymore to sort of be able to invite groups of friends to things. So it was really around creating engagement strategies to get groups of younger people to come together so that they can have a social experience there that they associate with the art. So I'm a, I'm a young student, a young bass player, somebody like listening to this, and I don't know what I'm doing, and I, I, I'm going to audition for orchestras, but my odds are lower than being on a major TV show, you know, in reality. And I want to I want to build my career. I love playing bass. I like social. I like doing some other things. Like, where do you even begin? I mean, it's so overwhelming. Like, where, like, where does somebody who's maybe like a senior in college, where do they begin with, with like building a career? It's a big question. I know, I'm yeah. sorry. That's I like. No, that. <laughs> no, it's it, it's a great question. It's sort of the one that we we start with um, <laughs> that we're working on all the time. You know, I would say that. You know, part of what we do with iCadenza is really trying to get in front of musicians at the early stages in their career so that they can see examples of what's possible and also get insight to the different skills that they need to start developing really early on. So, I mean, I think it's a few things. You know, number one is 
having an idea of who you are and what you want to do in the world. What kind of impact do you want to have? What is your music going to do for people? I, I've been thinking about this a lot. The fact that, you know, so much, there are sort of two pathways that performers are looking at. One is getting hired to do gigs, to perform in a context that someone else defines. And that can be a really successful path. And there are really particular strategies you can take to get there in terms of networking, in terms of building your reputation, all of that. And then another pathway is thinking about what it means to be an independent and sort of autonomous artist where you define what your career is about and the impact that you want to have. That might mean creating your own performance opportunities or you know, creating a show that you can book yourself. So I think it all starts with what your vision is. Then we have other sort of core principles that we lay out in terms of when it comes to networking or how you position what you talk about, self-reflecting and sort of identifying the ways you stand in your own path. I think all of those things are a big part of it. Well, you know, that, you're, you're hitting on something that I believe, and I, I think it's an interesting thing to think about. I think a lot of musicians don't think about this, but I think that a lot of musicians confuse freelancing with entrepreneurship. When reality, they're very different things. I, I think freelancing is a type of working for somebody else, and and that I think I, I just love to know your thoughts on it because, like you know, like I'm I'm gonna go play uh, with the Iris Orchestra in Memphis. I was just playing this Harry Potter thing here in San Francisco. I'm gonna go play a little San Francisco Chamber Orchestra, whatever. I've got my private students. I would consider all that a type of freelancing, even the private students. Now. Maybe taking that private studio and like finding a creative way to build it or or creating my own concert and, and, and that sort of thing. I think of that as entrepreneurship. I mean, is that kind of your definition? That's definitely how I think of it. You know, it's interesting, the word entrepreneurship. I feel like some people take issue with it. Some people don't want to be defined that way. But I, I agree with you that I think pursuing an entrepreneurial career really means being mindful about where you want to be going and the kind of artistic impact that you want to have on the world and then creating it, creating the pathway for that to exist. And I think that can exist when you're hired for someone else's context to, you know, perform the music they give you and sort of do what, what someone else defines. But I do think a truly entrepreneurial pursuit is really starting with that question for yourself of, what is my artistic vision that I want to get out there? And how do I create a, a structure and a business model that's going to make that possible and sustainable? The thing that I think a lot of academic, uh, music entrepreneurship, whatever programs, hone in on is it, it kind of boils down to, and this is maybe an example of places that maybe could be doing more, is basically like marketing your chamber music group. And that seems to be like a, a, a big thing. Uh, how valuable is that to focus on and then maybe like what are some other things that would be other other steps that you could do? Yeah, well, I think I mean, I think marketing is a big thing, but I really see it as just one piece of the puzzle. You know, I feel like marketing is sometimes taken to just mean, all right, you do your social media, you sort of do this this checklist that we define. But instead, how are we? I mean, I think what the goal is for any musician is how do you do what you want and how do you earn enough money so that you can make a living and and how can you measure the impact that you're having if that's something that is meaningful to you. So I really think all of that goes beyond marketing or or requires a vastly expanded definition of what marketing is. So I think it's really thinking about what are the services that you provide? How do those work financially? How do you define them? How can you get creative about the different ways that people can engage with your art and pay for it? And how do you, you know, build, build an audience, build a network and a community that's going to sustain all of that and take it to the next level? So I really think it goes so far beyond marketing, in my view, at least. You know, even the word marketing, I think so many people have a negative connotation with it, right? And they're like, oh, I don't want to do that, or that's sleazy, or that's dirty, or that's selling, and they just don't even want to, th- th- it just sends chills down their spine even hearing that word. Like, how do, how do people reframe that, or how would you reframe that? Because I mean, I've struggled with that myself. That word does not send chills up and down my spine anymore, but I was definitely in that place. Like, like how do people get over that? 
It's interesting. It's really a common thing that you're describing. Uh, my business partner, Julia, and I actually wrote a book that speaks to this topic a lot called Awakening Your Business Brain, which is all about how to redefine how we think about business and which includes marketing and those other unsavory topics. <laughs> um, how do we relate to them in a way that is more creative, authentic, uh, connected to our artistic sides? I absolutely think it's possible. I think the big thing for me is recognizing that at the end of the day, this whole thing that we're doing is all about people mm -hmm. and all about building connections and creating meaning. I mean, at least I think that's why people go into music to experience that kind of connection. And we can find it on so many different levels. I think as musicians, we're used to experiencing that in the concert setting or in a one-on-one -on -one setting with a student or in a, uh, an educational outreach event, but we can also create that through our different marketing channels, whether it's through the content that we share our online blogs, podcasts, any other sort of promotion. How can we remember that what we do brings value and meaning to people's lives? And we need to, need to use the different stages that exist, whether it's the literal stage or the internet as a way to exchange that value. So I think, I think that's how I reframe it. I mean, in taking any action that is blasting a message to a lot of people, there is fear and there is discomfort that goes along with that. I think that's natural, but it, it is also a way that we can convey a lot of value. So let's say I'm on Facebook, for example. I, I, I've kind of gotten over my marketing uh, phobia, and I'm on Facebook, and I put out, you know, I, people like uh, uh, something I link to, maybe I share a friend's concert or something like that. Uh, what do, What are some ways? Just Just think about Facebook that that I can I can start to grow a following, a reputation. Like, how can I use that platform in particular right now? That's a great question. I think Facebook is it has its challenges, and yeah. it's also incredibly powerful. I mean, everyone is there. I was talking to my friend Chrysanthi Tan not too long ago, who I think does an amazing job with her, all of her promotion, all of her um, audience engagement, and through Facebook, she does an exceptional job. And I think what I've learned from observing her is just seeing how we, if we can bring more of ourselves to how we do social media, the actual human side then engagement improves. So doing more than just saying, hey, come to my concert or hey, check out this article, really thinking about, you know, who am I as a human? What do I want to say? What do I want to know about my audience? How can I start a conversation? You know, how can I create content that is meaningful and valuable, whether that's sharing a video of, of something or a short musical thing that is tailored for the Facebook platform, you know, a video that's short that's posted right there. Or maybe it's a post that is just some heartfelt expression of something. So I think we almost have to step outside of ourselves and really ask, okay, how would I just interact if I were interacting with a friend and being a normal person and not this musician attempting to market myself? I think th I think that's what people go into, right? It's like the digital equivalent of like walking up to someone and giving them a business card, right? Mm -hmm. You know, like you would never do that. That's like a bizarre human interaction. But how frequent that is? Uh, th there's a trombone player named Matt Waters who plays in a group called Fan and Brass. They're based out of L.A. and he wrote an article. Maybe you saw it, but it's titled "Good Good Title: uh, The Orchestral Dream Is Dead," and it got mm -hmm. a lot of traction. And it was, and, and I had him on my podcast to chat about it. It was like one of those things that popped up and it was a very compelling title, clicked it, read it, and it was really honest, just like you're describing. It was just like this, here's what I've been struggling with that I, I'm, I'm scared to admit and all my friends are scared to admit, and, but, let's, but here's this, here's this problem, here's what we all face, here are the quote unquote lies that we're all told in our career. And it was just remarkable what legs that had. And I saw these thoughtful comments coming in from the principal base of the San Francisco Symphony here. He wrote like a three mm. paragraph. Con and so it's amazing what those genuine, just like being a human online, what an impact that can make. Are there any specific, so, and it could be blogging, Facebook Live, YouTube, whatever, but like what are some ways that people can just use this technology to be a little more authentic? Like what, what's an example of, of what somebody could experiment with? Mm. 
Yeah, I think I think that's such a great point. And I think especially in music, we there are so many reasons that we put on this facade and don't want to be honest and vulnerable because of what we think that will do to our reputation or whatever it is. And yet there are so many shared stories and experiences that we all have. And I think it builds connection if we can go there. You know, in terms of different social media platforms and specific ways to use them, I think first it starts with, you know, identifying for yourself, how do I like to communicate? Where do I feel my strengths are? Do I like writing? Do I like writing long form things? Or am I sort of a, a witty, pithy person who can communicate in short phrases? Or do I like photography? Or do I like video? Sort of finding your natural communication zone, I think, is a good place to start. Because I would never suggest to someone, all right, you need to go from doing nothing to using all of the different social media platforms at once consistently and well. You know, I think just starting with one is a great way. And any of them can be effective. The only thing is, you know, it's interesting. Like for me, I wrote this blog post the other day that was quite vulnerable. And we sent it out to our email list. And there was a part of me that wanted to just be done with it and be like, all right, we did it, did my job. But then, you know, it really takes promoting it in the other channels. It's not really creating new content, but circulating within the different content channels what it, what it is that you create to create that feedback loop and to get new exposure in. So I really think it can be anything. But I think it's like learning how you like to communicate, identifying what platform aligns with that the best. And, and then also finding other people who you think are really good at using it and just learning from them. You know, getting constant inspiration is such a helpful way to refine what you're doing. You know, every generation thinks that the current state of affairs is falling apart and things were so great back in the day, right? I mean, people these days, they talk about, oh, the, the 70s and the 80s, you know, the jobs, we had all these recording jobs and orchestras were doing so much better. And I'm sure in the 70s, people were like, oh, it wasn't like the 50s, all this. And then the people in the 50s, oh, it wasn't like the... 20s with the, all the the uh, talk, the silent film, you know, and obviously like, oh, or orchestras are falling apart. Uh, again, not that any of these statements are true, but the, the jobs are shrinking, tuition is rising, we're going into this world with these $200,000 degrees with like no clear future. But at the same time, I see all these young people finding success, right? So uh, let's just say, like, and I have a lot of conversations with parents or people that are worried about their children going into something with an unclear future. And you could argue that everything's getting unclear like that, that people are going to be more like musicians. But like, what would you say to somebody who's concerned about their child, their 18-year-old, heading out on, the, on a music degree path? Like, what, what would you say about just the state of finding a career in this world here in 2017? It's really interesting. I think I agree with you that I think I think there's incredible opportunity right now. I think it's a great time to be a musician. I think there's technology has changed the game. It's changed what exists in terms of us being able to connect directly with our audiences. That's a huge, huge deal. The thing is, you know, what it takes to succeed is a skill set and a mindset that is not, it's still not the majority of what's taught in music school. And that's okay. But I think that's something that parents and aspiring musicians should know that yes, it's very important to be excellent at your craft and to continue always working at that. But there's this whole other set of skills that anyone can build. I highly believe this. I think it's a lot easier to get good at all of these skills than it is to achieve mastery at your instrument. Um, but these skills are necessary in order to have the impact that you desire as a musician, in order to be playing in the, in the rooms with the people that you want to play with, and in order to have an income that you need to support your life. So I think it's really, you know, just acknowledging that if we want to go into music, this is basically deciding that we are going to be independent business owners. And there's a lot of responsibility that goes along with that. And, you know, a lot of time needs to be invested in making that happen beyond just working on our craft. So it's something that we work on a lot through iCadenza. We have this new initiative called Coro by iCadenza, which is this 
ongoing career support platform that provides online education on all kinds of topics related to having a, a career in music, the professional development side, as well as community and mentorship uh, aspects all worked in there. And we're starting to work with universities to provide this as a layer of support that they can be offering to their students from the very beginning. So I think, I think it's a great time to be a musician. I do think the level of student debt that many musicians are taking on is concerning and all the more reason why you need to create a business model for your career that's going to make sense. Well, and, and what a great way with Coral and with what you've built to, to do that with like-minded people, you know, without regardless of geography, whether I live in Chicago or San Francisco or uh, Pocatello, Idaho or wherever, right? What does the struct, if, so if, if, if someone joins Coro, what's, what's the structure look like? Do you do something on a weekly basis? Is it access to materials? What does that all look like? So if someone joins Coro, they get access to a growing library of online micro courses. So these courses are pre-recorded. They can be accessed at any time. They're created by members of the iCadenza team and also in partnership with incredible experts throughout the industry and professors from top universities. Topics range from how to network more effectively, resumes and cover letters, how to be a good collaborator, financial planning, how to use writing to build an audience, all kinds of topics. And we're continuing to add to the library. And we can do so rapidly and sort of adapt to all of the changing um, needs in our field. So that's one aspect. Then the other aspect is uh, a Facebook community for all of the members where we have a lot of facilitation from our side, but we're also fostering conversations with our members who are all over the world in this really positive and supportive conversation about having a career in music. So that's been my favorite part is just to see all these people come together and want to be honest about what their struggles are and who want to support each other. And then the third aspect is something called Coaching Labs, where for members who sign up for our Coro Pro level, they can get access to about 12 hours a month of coaching sessions. These are group, small group coaching sessions accessible through video chat. And you can just show up and ask your questions. And me or another member of my, of my team will be there to provide personalized coaching support. So that's what we do. It's been really amazing. And I think online education is so powerful. So, you know, we couldn't do this without the technology that exists. All right, that is our conversation with Jennifer Rosenfeld. iCadenza.com is her site. And as we mentioned, I'm going to be on their show coming up soon, too, which will be a lot of fun. Jennifer is somebody who I've heard about for years at this point, and it's great to sit down and chat with her. I really hope you got something out of this conversation. We're all trying to take our career to the next level, whether it's in terms of marketing or developing new income streams or all that kind of thing. Jennifer's on a great mission and I encourage you to check out what she's up to in Coro. And definitely, obviously, we referenced all these other people. Check out the show notes if you want to follow along with all the different music, business, and entrepreneurship topics that we've covered on the podcast before. All right, that's going to do it for another episode of Contrabass Conversations. We will be back to the world of bass next episode. But I really hope you enjoyed this. And I will see you again soon for more life on the low end of the spectrum. Wow.